It is so good to be here together. We've come to worship God who loved us before we were yet born, who knows us even better than we know ourselves, whose presence never leaves us and whose love for us never ceases. This is our God. Let us pray. Lord of wondrous light and power, we come to you this day to learn of your will for our lives. Calm our minds, heal our wounds, lift our spirits, give us courage and confidence to boldly serve you in all that we do. Let us continue in prayer with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's first hymn is hymn number 12. Praise him, praise him. Please stand if you are able. at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household 
and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. We honor our mothers, we give grace for their memories and thanks for their sacrifices. Amy is going to come forward and give us a moment's permission. A, an email earlier uh, this week or late last week uh, that I wanted to share with you all. It came from Pam Leonard, who is community relations and camp manager at Kirkwood, who we've supported in the past. She says, I am so excited that we will be having our overnight camps again this year and thrilled to share that the reservations are coming along nicely. At this time, we still have space in each of our free camps. If you have families that would still like to register their children, please have them do so soon. As we are planning for the youth and children to join us this summer, I wanted to reach out with an opportunity for you to help us. We made a conscious decision during the COVID-19 shutdown to donate many of our wooden beds to a ministry that in turn was able to share them with families in desperate need of a place to lay their heads. While we are grateful to be able to help this ministry, we are now looking to purchase some new metal beds. I wanted to reach out and see if there might be any churches that would want to help. Since Kirkwood this year is free to all American Baptist youth and children, we are hoping that you might have set aside funds that would help us to purchase some new beds. If you would like to donate, um, if you find it in your heart to do so, then you can use one of the envelopes that is in your pew and just write on it bunk beds or Kirkwood, um, one of the two, and we'll make sure that it gets to Pam Laird that they will be able to buy these bunk beds, metal bunk beds for the kids. We're excited that it's a free camp uh, for all kids. I know many in this church have been to Camp Kirkwood and been able to utilize their camp facilities, and back then it cost quite, quite a bit to do so. so um, I'm just, I'm excited that they're allowing American Baptist children to come and experience that this summer for free. So if you would like to support them, please do so. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. I know my kids had such a great time when they attended Camp Kirkwood. Um, so uh, it's, it's exciting that they are making it free for all campers this year. So now is the time in our service that we have the opportunity to give back a portion of all that we have received. May we find joy in our giving. Would the usher please come forward to receive this morning's gifts? <laughs> Thank you that we can always trust in you. 
You are an abundant God, and out of your great mercy, you have given us so much. We give you this offering today. With it, we worship you and give our whole selves to you. Please take it and use it for your kingdom and your glory. Extend and multiply its reach and influence, we pray. May it be a great blessing to many. We ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, 13 through 22. And Peter was one of the apostles, and he would, these letters are ones that he was writing to um, other Christians who lived in the northern part of Asia Minor to encourage them and to give them um, some examples of trusting God and um, how they should live their lives. So... Starting in verse 13, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of the slander. It is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteousness for the, for the righteous and the unrighteous. To bring you to God, he has put to death in the, he was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, when the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through the water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, whom has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Thus ends today's reading. Our next hymn is, is hymn number 453, Happy Our Home When God is There. Please stand if you are able. Moses' parents hid him for three months 
after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child. They were not afraid of the king's edict. But by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger, or anger, he had persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Uh, may God add blessing to this, uh, this report. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that on this Mother's Day, uh, that we can uh, reflect on the impact of life and sacrifice of, of our mothers. And, uh, and we just ask that uh, there be a grace about their memory, uh, there be some gratitude that we would have toward uh, the sacrifices and the things that they have put together in our life. And we ask for the grace from you to uh, continue to guide, to mentor, to mother, and to uh, share uh, of things that would be a benefit. We thank you for the women who mentor other women. Uh, as scripture has called for them to be about, that the older women would teach and instruct and bless. And so we just ask for your guidance as we reflect on uh, this Mother's Day. Amen. Well, I, I had uh, been thinking about, uh, you know, what, what would we say about Mother's Day? And, uh, you know, often uh, Janie will say, when I tell some stories, she'll say, your mother was a saint. <laughs> so, and, and I think that's probably uh, something that we could... Uh, hear from, we, we had a gathering, we were with some, some friends and family, and we were sitting and listening to stories that were being told, and the mother in the room did not know all of these stories. Was, you know how that goes, you, you go to the family gathering, and then these stories come out uh, decades later, and the mother says, well, I knew you were up to something, I just didn't know what was that, <laughs> right? And, and some of those stories were being told, and uh, there is... Motherhood is not for the faint of heart, right? You've got to have, and, and I thought, you got to have some grit. My mother had, uh, you know, if you, if you think of in terms of, you got to have some determination. I was the youngest of four boys, and I had a sister even older, and she kind of helped. She was 12 years older, and she kind of helped keep things in line, but my mother needed all the help that she could get. Uh, to, to keep us in line, but uh, you know we were we were an active bunch. I, I don't when I hear other stories from other families, it's like well, there's a whole lot of mothers that had to have grit, and uh, you know there are some amazing things that that our mothers have put up with and done, and yet uh, had had to have a grace too. I will hear this expression often in prison when guys are talking about their mom, uh, they said, well, mom would say, I brought you into the world. I can take you out of the world, right? And, and so they had to have a grace with them, not just some conviction. So grit and grace are some characteristics that women have got to have when they're raising kids. And uh, it's almost true when you're trying to mentor somebody too. And I think, uh, how many times you've got to have a determination to get people on a path and, and then some grace to allow them to still want to work with you. Now, biologically, we can't exactly change all that stuff. So uh, when you mentor people, you got to have perhaps more grace than you do as a mother. I don't know. But um, I remember, uh, like, last night we saw Charlotte, you know, who's she three still? She's four. Okay, so I was like, hmm, I'm gonna lose track here. It is, it is hard to keep track. See, that's what uh, men lead toward women on. It's like, hey, keep track of the age of the kids, right? Yes. Yes. All right. And and so Charlotte uh, loves her kitty, and the the household's kitty, and she's like showing me the cat, and that cat got more abuse. And, and she's dragging it around and carrying it around. She leans on it, and the cat's like, what are you doing? 
but did not scratch her or anything else. And I was like, that cat has some grit and grace as well. And uh, it reminded me of when I was a kid, I didn't always, you know, we had cats on the farm. Now a dog was a pet and a cat was just a farm animal. Uh, we had some that came around the house. And I remember when I was pretty young, I was like, I had heard that a cat will never, it always lands on its feet. And, and so I was like, okay, I want to see if this is true. <laughs> so I held up the cat upside down as I could, high as I could, and I dropped it. I was like, it landed on his feet. And somehow or another, I convinced it to come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I held it lower, and it's like upside down, and it dropped on his feet. And I don't know how I caught the cat again, but I caught it. And I, I had it upside down, and I kind of threw it, like, almost like threw it down. And my mother was there and saw this action. And I got a reprimand about how God loves cats, and I need to respect the cats. And Danny says, your mother was the same. And, and so I was just trying to do a science experiment. I wasn't really trying to harm the cat. But I couldn't understand how the cat could always win that battle. And uh, so... I, and then I saw somewhere a couple years ago that some scientists had done the same thing. It's like, well, how did they get to publish their results? And I got punished for not. <laughs> I, I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. But mothers need uh, to have some grace, right? So that they don't take their kids out of this life. Or that they, they have a, a punishment, a correction that's appropriate. And so that you can still keep the household together. It's, it's a really good thing. Well, when I looked up, I was like, I wonder what, what kinds of things would come up if I looked for grit, as it has to do with mothering. And there was a, uh, a book called Heroic Women of the Bible, and they actually titled it Grit and Grace. <laughs> Heroic Women of the Bible. And so... And then I looked again, I was looking farther, and I saw, well, here's a grit and grace project. <laughs> it was about women. I was like, wow, so a lot of people recognize this and publish. See, once again, I got punished, and then other people published, and so I don't know. And, and they had a grit and grace project, which included a podcast for women to say, okay, this, these are things that we need to talk about, and they would go through the various topics that, that women would need to know in, in helping their, uh, the younger women. It would be women with some experience helping others in their parenting. And it's like not a bad thing. And then there was even another grit and grace, devotions for what they called, it says devotions for warrior moms. Like they really know they're in the trenches, right? <laughs> so for warrior moms. And, and these were all some things that we recognize that there is a lot of help, a lot of advice, a lot of support that should come for women. And so that is a really good thing. Now, beyond that, there is also a recognition. I think my mom, as a homemaker, and being on the farm, it would be farm tasks she would do. She was always busy doing a lot of stuff. And, and yet, I don't know if she fully appreciated her value and her contribution. I know that she knew she was doing what needed to be done and she took pride in what she was doing, but I don't think she really understood her value. Now some, some uh, different companies and uh, actually publications tried to put a value on what is the value of what a woman does in the household if she's raising kids and uh, they, I had heard some time ago, well, they were probably a decade ago, they were talking about $67,000 is the value of what that woman would do as a, a person at home. And, uh, and then there were also studies for if women were working outside the home, they still were doing an unequal share of duties around the home. Men have a way of hiding from that stuff. Usually we blame it on tryptophan at Thanksgiving and say, you know, that, that tryptophan makes us sleep. You eat the turkey and you sleep, but it, the women aren't sleeping. They're, 
They're still having to clean up my ear, right? This, this is what I'm reading. I don't know, maybe that's, maybe that's in my household. And my, my mother was a saint. Yes. And I, but there was another study that was done by US News and World Report and they talked about even the cost of a surrogate mother, and they calculated some kind of cost of $100,000 $200,000 just in birthing a baby. Like, whew! And, and then we were looking at, uh, there was an insurance company say, so if you watch Antiques Roadshow, and they talk about, okay, here's the assessment value of this antique, and then they say, for insurance purposes, they give another value and that's higher than that appraised value. Well, here the insurance company said, if you need to replace this person and what they do at home, you need per year, $184,820 is what they said. It's like, wow, who can afford that? And they said over 20 years, their estimate of what the insurance company loves to put on it, was $3.69 million for 20 years. This is what it's gonna cost. And you say, is there some value in that? Yes, I mean, does that are those numbers crazy? Yes. But is there some actual value in what people are doing around this that needs some greater appreciation? I think my mom needed some greater appreciation that we as kids, we loved her. We, you know, were, we called her blessed. Yes. But to really appreciate, there are some things that are simple that we need to do to show appreciation for the people that are doing amazing things around us. This was true. We were even thinking about, hey, you know, one of the neighbor girls that we used to have, uh, we moved and she was still there. We said, hey, I wonder what it would cost for her to come clean. We heard she's in the cleaning business now. This may shock you as much as me. But we said, well, what does she charge an hour to clean? And she said, $50. Does anybody want that job? But $50 an hour is what she said she's charging for cleaning. I don't know, maybe we just don't even know what, what things cost these days. But some of you might want to pick up some hours somewhere. <laughs> because you certainly <laughs> certainly can pay some bills with that. But how does a how does a house cleaner need a six-figure income? I'm not not quite sure, but I would say this. The the menial tasks that are done are really important. They're really important. And so we should not just take it because someone does something without charging us that it's not of great worth. The very service and the heart that's in it, the, the things that are done in taking care of our household and our families are really some important things. Typically, the women are the event planners. And, and I was talking to Abraham and you know we, we had met up with some friends and we were talking about getting together or something and he's like, no, and I said, well, I just let Janie talk to the wife of this couple, and, and then I just kind of get on to the schedule, whatever happens with the schedule, I try to align with that. And, and he's like, well, now why don't you talk to the man? I said, because it always gets messed up. <laughs> we, we can never fully do that without the women putting that stuff together. Maybe that's our incompetence or unwilling. I don't even, I don't even know what it is. I just know when women are working something and it works out well, we should appreciate them. <laughs> that, that would be the thing that I would say. We need to appreciate what is done. Well, I want to uh, take a look at uh, Moses and his mother, uh, and this takes me to uh, a favorite uh, passage and story of mine. And uh, what I wanted to look at with that was just the recognition of when hardship comes, uh, and as it did for God's people in Egypt, hardship had come, and, and yet she had to parent in that scenario. And so, uh, so what had happened is the Israelites were oppressed 
And uh, as they were, you know, Joseph had, had been taken into slavery, went into Egypt, and, and the king was, or not the king, but the ruler, the pharaoh was recognizing that, hey, wait a minute, there's a whole lot of these people here now. You know, they could uprise. And so he, he didn't want them to overtake them. And so what he wanted to do in Egypt was to kill off the firstborn sons. It's like, well, we could deal with, you need the men to do the, the work of slavery, and you needed uh, the women around and the girls would not be a risk, but we were going to. And so with that, in that setting is when we see that Moses was a baby and he would have been killed. And so... Uh, so from Exodus chapter 2, a man from the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when they saw he was a fine child in the in light of he was going to be killed, she hid him for three months. And she could no, hide him no longer She because, you know, babies make noise sooner or later. And, and she got a papyrus basket for him. And she coated it with tar and pitch, and she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Now his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. So they were hoping that this baby would get adopted, essentially. Well, Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank, and she saw the basket among the reeds, and she sent her female slaves to get it. And she opened it and saw the baby, and he was crying and felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. They could tell from the blanket. And, uh, and so, and then his sister, Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the, so she jumps in. This is my favorite part of the story. Because not only is he saved, but his sister goes in and says, should I get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Like, okay, so he's taking, they're taking him home to his mom, and his mom is now protected. It's like, yes, she said, go. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take the baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. All right, this, this is awesome, right? Because he gets saved, and, and then she gets paid for raising her own child. It's like, this woman got the right value, right? So not everybody gets the, the compensation that they ought to have for raising their kids, but she did. And so, and she named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. And it's an incredible thing to think that in the midst of adversity, God has plans. In the midst of adversity, God has plans. And so there are, I think, for people of faith to recognize there are things pronounced over us and our children that we should not stand for. Just like with this case, it's like these kids are not going to live. These boys are not going to live. Or, you know, there are people that are afraid to have children in this day and age because the world's kind of crazy. And I saw a t-shirt that says, you know, normal's not coming back. Jesus is. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, that's, that's not bad because... We recognize that a lot of things have changed in the culture, and our hope is still in God. And so we, we need the encouragement to uh, move on and to act in accordance with our faith, knowing that God is going to reward us. I think how many times that uh, people have to act on their faith to really uh, come into the fullness of the promise that God has on their behalf. Many times, as, as I see guys who have turned their lives around in prison, it's because of some grandmother with faith has spoken over their life, has given them wisdom and guidance, has, has had to grit the determination, the faith, and the grace to continue our relationship with someone that has made a number of mistakes. And they say, I'm not going to leave this as a tragedy. I'm going to proclaim something good. I'm going to speak some things in your life that later come around. And that person's heart gets determined. Very often, 
the people whose lives are are changed have had that person in their life. And I was talking to Janie this weekend, and I said, what, what do people talk about in your counseling? And a lot of times it's that someone has, there's been a very difficult circumstance and situation with a mother or difficult things that they need the encouragement to get over some very difficult things rather than a person who has persevered and laid claims on we're going to have a success in this family. We're going to get through the adversity. We're going to count on God to get us there. And, and we're going to have grace enough that we're not uh, abandoning you, but we're calling on the Lord on your behalf. And so there is much that we have to do to call on the Lord on behalf of our kids. And uh, I, I will say that uh, when, when we had gone... Uh, out on vacation, we went on a cruise and we met this couple. Uh, there was a couple that was married. How many years were they married? Uh, about 50 some years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 50, yeah, 53 years. They went on a cruise and they took their whole family on the cruise. They had two kids and grandkids that they took on a cruise for their 50th. And then they came back and they were cruising again just as a couple. And they were the sweetest couple. And one of the things that they talked about that I just really admired is they wanted to hold on to their children and their grandchildren. It's like, we're not going to let go of them. They're going to be in our lives. And so uh, they said that when we have them over to the house, we don't have them watching their, their phones. We don't have them watching tablets. We collect those and what we do, and we don't watch TV when they talked about the streaming that would, they would do on their own. It was like they would stream shows like anybody else and uh, binge watch some things. But they said when the family's over, we have game night. And we do this thing with game night. And she said that one of the greatest compliments we had was our grandkids were asking, can we bring somebody else over for game night? That is a good thing. It's kind of like, can we bring somebody to the fire pit, right? Mm -hmm. Can we bring somebody to the family conversation? Can we bring them to the campsite? Those are the kind of things where we know that we can have some influence and talk to them and know, hey, we're moving things forward in this family. Positive values are shared. And, uh, you know, one of the things when we get together in the men's fellowship, I really appreciate that, you know, we got real men get together. We talk about real issues. There's no pretense there. It's just a good thing to be able to talk and share some life, life lessons and some wisdom just informally in that way. God will bless when we share with others in that way. And when we hold on in faith, to those family connections that's going to bless us and bless others from it. And so those are the things that we need to be about. So we're to talk about the things of the Lord in ways. Teach your children while you walk along the path. While you're going through life, teach your children the instructions of God and look for the blessings that you can, can give. Not just in a formal setting, but just as family values. I think many times as, as we grew up on the farm at home, my dad kind of lived out Christian values. My mom did more of the talking, but you know, I was learning from both of those. And, and yet we would, uh, we had this habit. My mom had, she was one of eight kids and we would, uh, on Sunday afternoons, we'd go visit family. We knew that we were gonna go visit family because we weren't doing field work that day. And it was uh, the time that we had to go make some visits. And we kept family and faith close. It was, it was a good thing. And I remember even going on vacation back in the days. Who had attendance pins back in the days for coming to Sunday school or church or something? Did you have some of those? It used to be the thing to do And when I was a kid. And I remember, I remember looking up to the people in the church that had those attendance pins and what kind of impact that they had on my family. 
And uh, when we went on vacation one time from the farm, somebody else was milking for us. I don't, I don't even know how that happened. But, uh, we went to Illinois and visited my family. We kept the bullet and then took it back so I could get that attendance pin. <laughs> and, uh, and my dad would get one as a farmer committed like that. But it, is, it was a, an incredible thing. And I remember the impact when my brother was working one time that somebody from the church that was part of the church family, he saw later in life in a restaurant for lunch, and he said, I, I bought lunch for them because I just wanted to give back in some way for what they've given into my life. That's the way church family is, right? Our family and our church family is so important that we want to give recognition and thanks and gratitude for the contributions and the impact that this has. And so, uh, so let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many people, uh, like the Sunday school teacher that I remember teaching me that we ought to make our bed. And uh, the simple things like that for those that uh, spoke into my life, for those that blessed my life, I give thanks. And together we uh, lift up thanks for the impact of those who had the grace uh, to be around us and to encourage us, who had the grit and determination to uh, be, stay steadfast to your truth and steadfast to encouragement and teaching and dedication and, and being people of character. So we, we thank you and we bless your name. Thank you for the many who've come together in the community around us to help us become the people who would look to you and follow you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's turn to him 49, Eric Brown. Thank you. 